This is Bijan Dagan. We're going to be talking about seed production or sexual reproduction in plants. To produce seeds, plants have to be pollinated. To be pollinated, there has to be a pollinating agent. And that is the subject of our discussion today. Production of seed is the result of two individuals. In this case, a pollen from one plant being transferred to the flower or the female flower of another plant. This is analogous to human reproduction, where the two unrelated individuals are usually involved. And when two unrelated individuals are involved, it usually implies genetic diversity. In other words, the plants in this case will be heterozygous, unless, of course, the plant is a selfer. In other words, there are some plants that will self-pollinate, in which case they will be homozygous. In other words, there are some plants that will self-pollinate, in which case they will be homozygous. Heterozygosity simply implies that having alternate forms of the same genes Genetic diversity is necessary under natural conditions in order for the plants to adapt to varying, changing climatic conditions. While in nature and under natural conditions, heterozygosity is an absolute necessity in order for the plants to survive, homozygosity or genetic uniformity, that is having similar genes in the same plant, is absolutely essential in agricultural crops. After all, we are dealing with monoculture, whether it is in animals, cattle, or in plants. There has to be uniformity. Woody ornamentals, in general, show a great deal of morphological variability when they are grown from naturally collected seeds, seeds that are collected in nature. And therefore, Variability is expected, and in this case, we consider the variability of the plants to be typical for that particular species. In man-made seedling populations, however, such as field crops or bedding plants, the primary cause of variation is usually attributed to the method of pollination. In other words, you may recall that I mentioned that in agriculture, in ornamental horticulture, environmental horticulture, plants have to be uniform because we usually propagate them either by uniform seed or by vegetated means. Regardless of what method we use, they have to be uniform. Where there is variability, however, it is usually the result of xenogamy, in other words, outcrossing, pollen coming from one plant to the female of another plant, or generally the plants being autogamous, in other words, be selfing, at least the initial generations of selfing. Or variability can be the result of hybridization between two related species, such as hollies and oaks, ilex and quercus. We're all familiar with hollies, for example. Ilex hybrid attenuata being a perfect example. There are many cultivars of this plant around, and they're all the result of hybrids between two different species, Ilex cuisine and Ilex opaca. Therefore, they're totally different parents, in which case we would expect heterozygosity. It is perfectly expected and natural. It is because heterozygosity is a problem and that we are in need of homozygous plants, that is uniform plants, that usually seeds are produced commercially under very controlled conditions. In the case of timber plants, forest trees, for example, there is a well-controlled seed orchard. Selected trees are usually hand-pollinated and seeds are collected very carefully so as there would be no foreign pollen coming in. Usually seeds are either collected from a known source in which case, such as a seed orchard, or usually, more often, 
most people purchase it from a commercial company that produce their own seeds under controlled conditions. To produce seeds under controlled conditions, we must be able to artificially pollinate flowers. To pollinate flowers artificially, it is absolutely necessary that we be familiar with flowers and flower structures. Of course, not all plants are exactly the same structure. They differ somewhat. But it may be useful to try to develop some understanding of what a flower is and what the function of a flower is. A flower, a typical flower, such as this lily that is being illustrated or the examples that you're looking at on the left, consists of four separate parts, the sepals, the petals, the stamen, and the carpal. The sepals and the petals are usually referred to as accessory organs. They are not directly involved in pollination. They are merely attractants or some function as a landing platform for birds or bees or, or, or uh, butterflies. The real reproductive organs are the stamen and the carpal. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail to develop a better understanding of it. Here's a schematic drawing of a flower. Let's start from the very base. There is a stalk called a pedicel with which the flower attaches to the stem or to the inflorescence. There is a receptacle. A receptacle is a location where all flower parts are usually attached. Then the accessory organs consist of the sepals, which are commonly known as calyx, or collectively, pardon me, known as calyx, and the petals, which are collectively known as corolla. Together, the petals and the sepals are known as the perianth. These, you may recall, we refer to as accessory organs because they are not directly involved in pollination. They are merely attractants or landing platforms. By contrast, stamens and carpal are the repro actual reproductive organs. A stamen consists of an anther where the pollen is actually produced, pollen grains are located, and a filament, which is the stalk with which it attaches to the, to the receptacle. That is the male organ of the flower. It provides the pollen. The female reproductive organ, or the pistil, sometimes known as the carpal, either name is perfectly acceptable, consists of three parts, a stigma, which is usually sticky or is covered with hairs, and when the pollen lands on it, it sort of gets stuck. The style is the column, is the stalk of the carpal. Then there is the ovary, which is, in flowering plants, actually develops into a fruit. The ovule, which is enclosed within the ovary, develops into seed. It is important to have a very good understanding of this concept. The ovary develops into fruit, and ovule develops into flower. The ovule is enclosed within the ovary. Let's look at this in a different way. Face view. We have the petals, known as corolla, collectively. We have the sepals, collectively known as the calyx. They are known as the perianth. Stamen is consists of two parts, the anther and the filament. The anther is where the pollen is produced and it's located. Usually when it splits, it releases the pollen and it gets transferred to the stigma of another flower or the same flower if they are selfers or autogamous. Then there is the female reproductive organ, which is the stigma the style, and the ovary. And you may recall that the ovule is enclosed within the ovary. This stigmatic drawing should assist with the understanding of 
where the reproduction actually occurs. Let's repeat this in writing so as to be sure we all understand the importance of knowing the flower structure. The stamen is the pollen-bearing pollen structure or organ of the flower. It is the male reproductive organ and consists of an anther and a filament. Carpal, the female reproductive organ, consists of a stigma, style, and ovary. An ovule is enclosed within the ovary. It is important at this point to remember that in gymnosperms, there is no ovary. An ovule is directly attached to a seed-bearing structure. When pollinated and fertilized, the ovary, as I noted before, becomes the fruit, and the ovule, that is in angiosperms, located within the ovary, becomes the seed. In gymnosperms, again, as I mentioned, there is no ovary, and the ovule is born directly on the sporophylls, or seedlings, hence the naked seeds in gymnosperms, <coughs> Excuse me, which incidentally, gymno sperm we means literally naked seed. Now, we need to know something about plant gender. Even though we are referring to the structure of the flower, we are actually referring to the sex of the plant, not of the flower itself. There are four possible conditions, and it is imperative that anybody who is trying to produce seeds be familiar with, this, with these conditions. Monoclinus means perfect flowers. In other words, looking at these illustrations, you can see that both the carpal and the stamens are present within the same flower. Monoecious. This refers to a single sex. Mono means one oecious sex, single sex. Flowers are imperfect. In other words, they may be on the same plant, as in this case, the illustration shows them to be, in fact, on the same inflorescence. But here is a female flower on the left, and there is a male flower with stamens on the right. Dioecious. Di means two. Two sexes. In this case, it implies that there are, in fact, two different individual plants. A plant with male flowers and a plant with female flowers. Hollies, of which these are the photographs of flowers. The flower on the left is female. You can see that the carpal is enlarged. The flower on the right is male, and therefore it has the pollen on the stamens. These are functionally dioecious in this case. Even though there, is, there are stamens in the female flower, they're aborted. By contrast, even though there is a rudimentary carpal in the male flower, it is abor aborted. Therefore, these two flowers are on two separate plants. To put it differently, if you were to grow hollies in your yard and you were interested in having fruit, you would have to have female plants with at least a male plant somewhere in the area, in the neighborhood. Polygamous plants are actually a combination of one or any other. In other words, polygamous plants may be monoclinous and dioecious, monoecious and dioecious, or a combination of all three. It is possible to have, as in the case of maples, acer, you would have female flowers, or you would have bisexual flowers where both male and female are present, or you could have only male flowers, and these could occur on the same plant or on different plants. This is a rather complicated condition. There are many other conditions, several others. However, for our purposes, just knowing these four conditions is more than sufficient. Here are a couple of examples, just to be sure we have a good understanding of what is unisexual and what is bisexual flowers. In this case, you have a female flower. Again, they are on the same inflorescence, as you may note. Some of these are male, but you have a female flower with a stigma, style, and a carpal. You have a male flower where there is no indication of a carpal. You only have stamens, which are covered with pollen. 
as you may know. These, on the other hand, these photographs illustrate bisexual or hermaphroditic flowers. Notice that in the case of peony, you have three carpels, three separate carpels, and a large number of stamens. Generally, there are more male plants than female plants, or more male organs than female organs, even in single bisexual flower. In the magnolia flower, you will see several carpels. All the upper parts of the flower are the stigma. All of the lower size, the whitish colors, are the stamens. Again, the number of stamens far exceed the number of stigmas, even though there are several stigmas in magnolia flowers. One other thing we need to know, and that is how shapes of flowers relate to what pollinates those flowers. The first thing you may note is that some flowers' parts are separate. In parts free, flowers where the parts are free are usually pollinated either by butterflies or by bees. Butterflies usually do not see red coloration, although they do accidentally land on them, they do pollinate them, but generally, more often than not, they are pollinated by bees, occasional butterflies. Yellow flowers, by contrast, are usually pollinated by both bees and butterflies. Rotate flowers, pinwheel-shaped flowers, are usually narrow. They belong to family Apocynaceae, oleander family, and it would have to be a butterfly pollinated flower because they have long proboscis, long mouthpiece that enters the narrow hole. Tubular flowers, particularly if they are orange, yellowish, or red, they are pollinated by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds have long bees and they're hovering birds and therefore they can reach to the bottom where they need to gather the sugary material. Campanulate flowers, by contrast, are almost always pollinated by bees because they require a landing platform and they can just walk simply, uh, simply walk to the bottom of the flower, to the base of the flower. Papillonaceous, the word papillonaceous means butterfly, papillon, a French word. They are, again, pollinated usually by butterflies because it requires a long mouthpiece to enter the very end. Ursulate flowers, by contrast, are usually bee-pollinated flowers because they're open-ended and a bee can easily enter the flower. Final form flowers are open flowers. Therefore, they could be pollinated by a number of animals depending on the color and whether or not they actually have a fragrance. Or, if they are white, then they would be pollinated by moths at night. Solver form flowers, similar to tubular flowers, if they are red or yellowish or orange, usually they are hummingbird pollinated. If they're not, then they are usually butterfly or bee pollinated. Bilabiate flowers, in other words, flowers that have two lips, bi means two labiate or bee pollinated. Bilabiate flowers, in other words, flowers that have two lips, bi means two labiate lips, usually are pollinated by butterflies, occasionally by bees if they can enter. Therefore, it is important to be familiar with flower shapes as well. Just so we know what a pollen grain looks like, these are pollen of cycads. They happen to be gymnosperms. But this is general features of pollen grain. The surfaces may differ somewhat. They may be knobs or they may be smooth, as is the case here. But they have different features. And depending on those features, the mode of pollination differs. If they are smooth, such as these, they are usually pollinated by insects. If they have a rough surface, knobby surface, then they are insect pollinated because they need to attach to the legs of insects or to the wings or other parts of birds. Okay. By definition, pollination involves transfer of pollen from the male stamen, that is the anther, to the female carpal, that is the stigma, in flowering plants, and from male cones to, f to the female ovule in gymnosperms. 
pollinating agents involve wind. Wind is involved in pollination of several plants, usually plants with either open flowers where the uh, stamens are exerted, in other words, they're above parts of the flower, or in the case of some gymnosperms such as pines and others. We will see examples of these later. Grasses in general are wind pollinated, and many trees because of their height and exposure to wind also are wind pollinated. Water. Very few plants are actually water pollinated, and these are usually plants that are aquatic. The pollen simply floats on water. Insects include beetles, bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, and moths, and very infrequently ants where there's actually glands on some part of the plant or the flower. Birds include hummingbirds, honey creepers, and honey eaters. In the United States, in North America generally, hummingbirds are, of course, the most common pollinating birds. Honey creepers and honey eaters are usually in Africa and Australia. Even mammals are involved in exceptional cases of pollination. Bats, for example, or rodents are perfectly capable of pollinating plants, totally by accident, of course, but nonetheless, they do function as pollinators. And here's an example of a bat pollination. Usually, bat pollinated flowers are white. They may have some fragrance, but they should have plenty of nectar. That is important because that is what the bat is actually after, fragrance, but they should have plenty of nectar. That is important because that is what the bat is actually after. Moth pollinated flowers are generally white and they're usually fragrant. Moths cannot see and therefore they have to go by the sense of their smell. Many flowers, such as this geranium, they have what is known as pollination guides. These are usually lines that direct bees. Bees can see these very well. And therefore, most of these are pollinated either by bees or sometimes by butterflies. Again, birds pollinate tubular red flowers. In this case, hummingbirds usually, as is noted in these tubular flowers. Uh, Campsis radicans or petunia, as the case may be, but generally reddish orange tubular flowers are pollinated by hummingbirds. Wind pollination requires that either the flowers have exerted stamens and stigmas, in other words, above the level of the flower itself, or more often have no petals or sepals. The petals of sepal simply would have to be lacking for plants to be pollinated by wind. Example, in the case of elms, you may note that there are actually no petals or sepals. In the case of birches, betula, there are no petals and sepals. Here is an inflorescence, and note that there is absolutely no petals or sepals. In grasses, again, the inflorescence is perfectly directly exposed and usually there are either no petals or sepals, or in some cases of monocots, they're usually few in number. In butterfly and bee pollinated plants, as I noted before, color makes a great deal of difference. Butterflies cannot see red, bees see all colors, and therefore you can see that in the case of rose and tulip, and butterflies cannot see red, bees see all colors, and therefore you can see that in the case of rose and tulip and papaver, these are pollinated usually by both by bees and butterflies, but more often than by butterflies than by bees unless the flower is yellow. Even aquatic plants such as these water lilies are usually pollinated by insects, not by wind, not by water. They usually require insect pollination to transfer from one to the other, pollen from one flower to another. As we discussed before, flowers that have unusual bilabiate shapes, such as the case with stachys and linaria and anterhynum, as we discussed before, flowers that have unusual bilabiate shapes, such as the case with stachys and linaria and anterhynum and a number of other flowers, 
they're usually pollinated by butterflies because they have long tongues and they can reach the base of the flowers. Bees, orchids, I'm sure many people are interested in orchids. They are usually pollinated by insects and generally by bees. There is such a case as pseudocopulation, where the female flower has a stri striking resemblance to female bee and therefore gets attacked by a male bee. In that process, the poly pollinia is removed and transferred from one flower to another flower. So it is totally accidental. Nonetheless, it is done not so much to get nectar or, or, or pollen, but simply by copulation process or presumed copulation. The same is true with Orpheus and a number of other orchids. Rodents sometimes do pollinate flowers. For example, the Proteaceae, members of Proteaceae, Protea, and an Banksia, and a number of others are pollinated by usually rodents. As is the case, most of these plants being African or generally mostly Australian, therefore that is where they are pollinated. Water, as I said, very few plants usually get pollinated by water, and they usually have to be floating aquatic where the pollen gets just simply gets carried by water to from one place to another. This table is a summary of what we have been talking about. Let me briefly just go over it so that you have a good understanding. Birds, bees, beetles, butterflies, and water and wind, etc., are the pollinating agents on the upper line. Activity time what kind of reward is the pollinator to be receive, whether they land or hover, what kind of vision they have, whether or not the flower has any kind of odor or fragrance, length of tongue or beak, as the case may be, the ability to locate flowers, and method of pollination are the subjects. Take the case of activity time. Birds, bees are usually active du during the day. So are butterflies. Beetles may be active primarily at night, but sometimes during the day. And the wind, and of course, doesn't apply. Wind and water does not apply. There is no particular time. If it is windy, it is going to happen. If the, if the water is floating, it is going to happen. What kind of a reward do they get? The birds get nectar. Bees get nectar and pollen. Pollen is necessary for feeding the brood and also the birds get nectar. Bees get nectar and pollen. Pollen is necessary for feeding the brood and also that's mostly where the honey comes from, the nectar. Beetles require pollen. They eat, sometimes they eat parts of the flower in fact. Butterflies require nectar. Other pollinating birds and others require nectar as well. And of course, this term is not applicable. Pay attention to this table. It will give you some very good ideas about what has happened. Uh, I would like to note the last two columns, however. How do they locate flowers? Birds do it by vision. Bees do it by odor and vision. Beetles do it simply by odor, butterflies, odor or vision, and the same with others. Of course, the term again is not applicable to either water or wind. Method of pollination, in the case of birds, it's carried on their body or their beak, just simply accidentally. In the case of bees, it's collected. The body parts, such as the legs where they are stored, the pollen is stored and carried back to their nest. Beetles, accidentally on the body, butterflies, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now knowing something about pollination, seeds are usually produced as a result of pollen being transferred from one flower to the stigma of another. By, by now, we are fully aware of that fact. Being transferred or to the stigma of another. By, by now, we are fully aware of that fact. 
Using this knowledge, seed producers usually hybridize plants or produce homozygous seeds, as we discussed earlier, and those are the methods that are used. The pollen usually lands on the surface of the stigma, and the surface of the stigma is either sticky or hairy. Either way, the pollen gets stuck on them. Usually germinates, and the sperm, the male sperms, are carried are carried to the egg. We will discuss that in detail when there is an opportunity in the lecture to do that. Let it suffice to say that ultimately the pollen tube bursts and releases the sperm into the egg, and that is how it's produced. Again, the analogy between reproduction between mammals and plants should be somewhat obvious. The only difference is that in this case, in case of plants, particularly flowering plants, there is the principle of double fertilization, where we get endosperm produced on the one hand and we get an embryo produced on the other. That involves two separate fertilizing or fertilization processes. In gymnosperms, on the other hand, most gymnosperms are pollinated by winds. Conifers, I should say, are pollinated by winds. But cycads, which are also gymnosperms, are usually pollinated by beetles. Older plants, generally plants that are older in terms of geological time, are beetle pollinated. For example, magnolia. Notice that it has similar shape to a pollen cone or, or a pollen or the cone structure and therefore the pollen is transferred from the male cone in this case to the female cone in cycads. In pines and other conifers, of course, usually they're open pollinated. You have male cones and you have female cones and it is just simply a matter of wind carrying the pollen from one to the other. It just so happens the pollen of pines and conifers also have wings. They have extended areas along the pollen, therefore it makes floating a lot easier. Thank you for your time.